Hello, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Kai Fu Lam. Uh, my topic today is B tagging using neural network. Um, so I got into this project about a year ago. I uh, didn't know what these terms mean, but uh, let's just start with this fun stuff here. I visited CERN uh, last Christmas break uh, in Geneva. And really thanks Sam for hosting me, the postdoc I've been working with. Um, so it was a great experience. It's one of these places that would give you a goosebump, right? Because, you know, this is really what defines humanity and the things that they're doing is pushing the knowledge of, you know, humankind. So it's really fun. And it, there's a cafeteria in CERN. And, you know, I'm probably one of the few people who don't have a PhD sitting in there. <laughs> and if you go to the tour in Geneva, uh, you can see the first cyclotron they have um, in CERN. And this light show is really cool. So since I talk about CERN, uh, talk about, I'm sure most of you already know what this is, but I'll just give a basic uh, briefing about what, you know, the CERN is. And CERN has uh, something called the Large Hadron Collider. It's like a big particle accelerator. And uh, so it's a 27 kilometer ring underground along the French Swiss border. Um, so what it does is accelerate protons inside the tunnel. Uh, to nearly the speed of light. So, and then, you know, go in the opposite direction and they'll direct these two protons and collide with each other in one of these detectors. So there are four main detectors there. The one is Atlas, CMS is basic, uh, is general purpose detectors. And then there's the HCB and LS as well. So when these protons collide, um, the detectors detect all these uh, particles that come out of it. And that's what a lot of particle physicists do is to analyze uh, the data come out of these uh, collision events. Uh, so this whole machine is basically a huge data generator. Uh, it generates, you know, 600 terabytes of raw data every second. But, you know, of course we don't save everything. We cannot save everything. So we save about 25 giga gigabytes of stuff uh, per second, right? Through, through uh, this uh, experiment. So, the next page. Uh, so again, my project is about particle identification. Um, so I started in 2016 uh, with no Linux and Python experience. And I had some courses in you know, uh, MATLAB and Java though. And for those of you who are undergrads who really want to get into this, I really highly recommend taking the Coursera course in machine learning. It's free, it's really great. Uh, gives you a basic idea of what, what uh, neural networks are. Uh, also, I bought my first MacBook, made me look like a particle uh, data scientist too. So, by the end of this talk, I hope everybody will be able to tell, like, answer these two questions, right? What is B tagging, and what is neural network? Okay. And the outline for the next half an hour or so. Um, so, I'll talk a little bit about particle physics, and then particle detectors, and then also. Um, some of the B tagging variables, right? Variables for um, identifying bottom quarks, the bottom jets. Uh, these variables will be something similar to like, if you have a fruit, an apple, you say, what's the attribute of the apple, right? Color, right? Whether it's seed or not, right? Whether it has meat or not, sweet or sour or whatever. So those are the variables, right? And then, so after that, we'll talk about ROC and AUC. These are the, uh, measurements for classification performance. Say, if I give you uh, a color red, it has seed and it's sweet, can you tell me it's apple, right? So like, if I give you the attributes of the uh, of the item, and can you tell me what it is, right? This is the measurement metrics. We'll go through that. And then we'll go into neural network, which is like a multivariate model, right, for, for classification. Say, I give, so instead of having just color red, and you tell me it's the apple. Now it, like if you like color red, have seed, it's sweet. Now you tell me it's apple, right? So, so we'll go through that. And then at the end will be conclusion, next step, and Q&A. Okay. Uh, back to the basic, what is particle physics? Particle physics is a branch of physics that studies the properties and interactions of fundamental building blocks of nature, right? As modern uh, particle physics start here, which is like cloud chamber with uh, uh, you know, uh, particles going through the cloud chamber and we study the trajectory of these uh, particles. Um, so this is like an alpha particle source and you can see the tracks. And um, in 
you know, all these in CERN, the, all these experiments have similar idea. So we also look at the trajectory of different particles inside the detector. But of course, nowadays we use, you know, sensors and computers to do that instead of just using, looking at the uh, cloud chamber. Um, so atom, hadrons, or quarks. So we start from the very basic. So atom, in elementary school, we know that, you know, atom made of a proton, neutron, and nucleus, and then the electrons, right, going around it. Uh, so, but we know that the proton and neutrons are not fundamental, right? You actually have substructure inside it. And so what they are is uh, they're quarks and gluons, right? So the, all these uh, protons and neutrons are made of quarks and gluons. Uh, what are they? So the gluons is like, you can think of it as the force exchange particle. It binds the quarks together, whereas the quark gives the structure. Um, so all the, these composite particles, uh, we give them, them a name. The group of these particles is called like uh, hadrons, right? So hadrons are made of quarks and gluons, and the quarks are bounded together by the gluons, and the gluons are the force mediator for strong force, right? That's how that's how the proton is made. And there are a couple of fun facts here. One fun fact is. Uh, all these atom diagram is wrong because the nucleus, should, if the nucleus is the size of a golf ball, the atom is the size of a stadium, right? So the majority of this is actually empty space here, but this doesn't really relate to my project. The next one is like the mass of a proton, for example, uh, majority of it is um, in the gluons, right? More than 90% of the energy is actually in the gluons and the quarks is actually only, you know, less than 5% of the energy is in the quarks. So uh, the majority of the mass of this proton is actually in the energy, not in the quarks, right, for the structure. This has something to relate to my project. The third fun fact would definitely relate to my project is if you want to, like, pick one of these quarks and pull it out, right, of the proton, by the time you pull it out, it needs so much energy that, you know, the quark will uh, form all the other gluons and other quarks around it already. So. So it's like, um, so there will be like, uh, you cannot separate out the quark on its, by itself, right? In normal circumstances. Okay, so next step. So this brings us to the standard model. So you know that we know that proton is not fundamental. Uh, so how about, um, you know, like a periodic table kind of, right, for elementary particles. So this is what it is. So it's called a standard model. So you see the electrons right here, you see up quark and down quark that make up the protons and neutrons right here. So they belong to a group called quarks, right, which interact with the strong force, the strong force mediator is gluon. And you have electrons here, which interact with a uh, weak force, is a group, this group of particles called leptons, interact with weak force, and weak force is uh, carried by C and W bosons. And uh, the, a lot of these uh, particles, these particles have charges, electrical charges, and these particles interact with photons, which is the carrier of electromagnetic force, like a light. And uh, so you have last one standing here called Higgs boson. Um, so theorists predicted, uh, proposed the Higgs boson back in the 60s and 70s to explain why weak force particles really short range, right? And we observed it the first time in 2012. Okay, so that's the in uh, that's the basic structure of this uh, periodic table called standard model, and but we know that the standard model is not complete, right? So, um, so one of the things is we are still you know seeing many other particles. We we have a theory out there called supersymmetry uh, to explain like to try to fill up you know the whole standard model. To, it, to its completeness. Um, so in order to study new theory like this, we need uh, to identify you know, fundamental quarks in the detector, right, directly. And so, so how do we do that, right? So uh, we'll go with, let's just pick you know, bottom quark to identify. And I'll explain why we pick bottom quark later. But if we were to identify, try to identify one particle you know, in the detector, let's try with bottom, right? And so what it does, um, so why bottom quark? So bottom quark is involved in a lot of uh, uh, physics processes. Uh, so for example, when a Higgs boson decay, 
the Higgs boson decay into um, the Higgs boson cannot be observed directly because it has a really short lifetime and it decays 57% of the time predicted by theory into bottom quarks and anti-bottom quarks, right? BB bar, the B bar is like the anti-bottom quarks. So if we can identify bottom quarks in the uh, detector, then you know we can study these kind of processes, right? And then also top quarks, which is the heaviest quark, um, decay into bottom as well, which is the next heaviest that we know of. Uh, again, if we can identify bottom, we can study the top process. And of, again, we can study new physics, right? That's what I talk about. So these are the physics reasons why we want to study bottom. Uh, but there's also a reason because like the lifetime of the bottom quark is in a sweet spot for the detector. I'll go into it a little bit, right? So there's like the physics reason why we want to study B bottom quarks, and there's a detector reason why we want to study bottom quarks, right? So, okay. So now um, we know what B tagging is at a high level. B tagging B means bottom quarks. Right, tagging means identification. It's kind of like you post a face on pic on face, you post a picture on Facebook, and then you tag a friend. Right, that's identification. Okay, so so we know what this term means at a high level, uh, but there's a caveat there. We can never again. We can never observe the bottom quark directly. Right, we only observe it as a composite particle. In the detector, we actually observe it observe it as a shower of particles like a collection of particles that we call jet, right? And a jet contains many particles inside, and each of those particles inside the jet will leave tracks, trajectories in the detector. So what do I mean by that? So, um, so again, this is like, you know, like two protons come together, smash together, right? It's really high energy, concentrated at a really small point. You create new particles here, heavier particles, like a bottom core, for example, is created. And when it fly out of the collision point, um, again, due to you know, um, QCD, what, what we call QCD confinement, uh, the bottom will you know, can exist by itself. It pull all the other, like some other particles together, and it form a bottom hadron, and the bottom hadron fly out right, for a while. And then when it fly out for a while, you get to a point, and then because the bottom is really heavy, it decays. And when it decays, it goes into other project, other other particles, right? So, there, you know, as the bottom hadron flying to here, it leaves traces around here. So there are like tracks here, and then, like the bottom, the bottom here decay, and they leave uh, particles around here, right? So in the detector, you see a lot of uh, particles, right, around, which is related to the one single bottom quark at the beginning, and so this whole thing is called B jet, bottom jet, right? Uh, so, a little bit of special relativity here. So, if you look at a particle frame, if you put a clock on a particle, uh, it's not traveling because you know when you put a clock on a particle, the particle is moving, but it doesn't know it's moving. The lifetime is you know 1.5 picoseconds, and the distance to travel is you know 0.5 millimeters, right? But in a detector frame, in the lab frame, in the human being frame, when we when we look at this. Um, uh, because the bottom core is traveling at nearly the speed of light, um, there's the time dilation there. And then we observe it as like 150 picoseconds. So it's 100 times of the time, right? Um, so because it's traveling so fast, 150 picoseconds, it can travel about five centimeters. So if we have a detector that is in this range, right, that can yeah, detect particles in this range, then we can study these kind of processes, right? Okay, so the five around the five cm mark is uh, what we're looking for. Okay, so now let's switch gear a little bit. Talk about detectors now. So we know that we need something along the five cm range. And uh, so, uh, do we have something like that? Yeah, we do have something like that in CERN. So this is uh, one of the experiment detectors in CERN called Atlas, right? So there's a the whole detector, how it looks like, and there's a human being for your size reference. And there are three main class of detectors in there. There's like the tracker, like detect the trajectories inside. And then outside is called the colorimeter. It's like detect the energy of the particle. And then the muon detectors, right? The muon fly out, but we, uh, muon is out of scope for this talk, but 
So we'll go to the next slide, give you a little bit more detail so you can see um, there's a vertical slice of that view and you'll see like the particle collision here and then all these particles fly out of it and then it goes through the tracking detector. These are different tracking detectors. You know, so it detects the trajectory of the particle and then the particle fly out here and then hit the colorim colorimeter and then uh, so we know the energy of that particle, right? So, and then one more. So now you see the uh, the scale, right? The distance scale. So like the innermost detector is at uh, 33 millimeters. So 3 cm, right? And 5 cm and 8 cm and 12 cm. So, so this is within range of uh, detecting the bottom uh, quark particles. Uh, right, so this is where the proton would go. Okay, and then you have uh, different tracking um, sensors out there. Okay. Of course, in reality, it looks like this, right? It's a mess. So like, you have all these trajectories. You try to, you know, uh, trace back to the origin of these tracks, right? And find where it is. And one thing, so one of the things you need is a coordinate system inside the detector now, right? Because you have all these tracks inside. How do you keep track of where they are? And this is the um, coordinate system that you know we use inside the detector. Uh, again, the Z is the beam line here going this way, and then the you know detector barrel is going around it, and then uh, so phi is uh, this angle is uh, the angle going around the barrel. Uh, theta or pseudo rapidity eta is like from zero pointing to the top to infinity to C. Uh, R is like, um, so it's a range, right, of uh, component of phi and then the eta, okay? Um, so this is the, how the coordinate system that we use to track uh, all these trajectories. So now, so now we look at what the bottom jet is. We look at the detector. So now we look at uh, what kind of variables do we get in my data, right? And from the detector. So, so how do you use the, you know, so, so again, we have algorithms that, you know, reconstruct the tracks to the, from the detector hits, right? So the detector detect all these hits and then, you know, it reconstruct all the tracks. And then we also have algorithms that trace the tracks back to the vertices. Um, so now what you want to see is that, um, so, so we have tracks, that trace back to vertices, right? This is a collision point. And then if we have a secondary vertex, this, this is a really high chance that, you know, it might be a B-jet, right? So if you trace the tracks back to a vertex, it's displaced from the primary vertex, right? Then you know that, okay, there's a long lifetime particle that fly out here and it can decay, right? So, so, so what, what we want to do is um, we want to, um, come up with certain kind of variables to describe these, right? Describe the displaced vertex here. And so the variables that we get is called um, impact parameters. And then another kind that we get is called secondary vertex. Okay, so, so for impact parameters, what it is is, um, again, this is your collision point here, proton, proton, collision point. This is secondary vertex where the bottom bottom particle um, uh, decay. So you can trace the tracks back to your vertex, but then if, this, if the track's coming from a location that is outside the collision point, outside primary vertex, then you can extend it back and you know there's a displacement here. So this is called a D0, right? And then um, this D0 is a transfer displacement of the tracks, right? Back to the project, uh, back projection. And then we also have C0, which is uh, you know, along the beam line itself, uh, along the transverse direction. Uh, so we use um, these uh, variables to tell you know, whether something, is, uh, something will have a displaced vertex, which indicate it might be a you know, bottom jet or not. So we use, uh, instead of D0, we use a D0 over sigma. It's like significance over the error. Uh, C0 over sigma, C0, like uh, C0 over uh, significance. Okay. 
So secondary vertex variable, some examples would be uh, uh, the vertex mass. If you reconstruct all the tracks to the vertex, uh, aggregate the mass, um, there's something called vertex energy fraction. So it's like what fraction of energy is related to that uh, secondary vertex compared to the whole jet. Um, so there's another kind of uh, variables that we use. Okay, so the data for my study um, contains, so yeah, so the, so the variables that I talked about before, they're at track level, right? They're for each of the track, but the jet contains many tracks, right? So um, I'll go back to here in a little bit. So, so then like, uh, so you have, so I have 16 observable variables for each jet, right? Developed from impact parameter and secondary vertex. And these data set is provided by Dan, who is like one of our um, one of the, uh, CG's collaborators, and use uh, MacGraph, Hythea, and Delphi simulation. It's a simulated data set. It's not a real data set. So MacGraph simulate the physical process. Hythea simulate the uh, uh, hydronization fragmentation process, and then Delphi simulate the detector reaction. So we get okay. We get the data set from Dan. 10 million examples, right? And each of the jet have one set of 16 variables. Uh, so these are the 16 variables here. Um, so we have uh, transfer momentum and the jet eta and then impact parameters, just like what we, what we talk about of variations of that. And then secondary vertex, uh, count of secondary vertex, you know, counts of tracks of secondary vertex. Um, so, so so this is like the data set that we use, right? To do, uh, try to identify bottom jet based on these variables, right? Okay. Um, so just an example of one of those uh, variables. So this is the third highest track D0 significance of the jet. So this is from Dan's paper, from Dan Guess, a uh, published paper from Cixi's paper. Uh, you can see the bottom quarks is red and charm and light is like um, these two lines here. So these are histograms. So this, are, oops. Okay, so these are histograms. So it's, okay. Wake everybody up, wake everybody up. <laughs> All right, exactly. It's a big stick, but okay. So, so these, there's a histogram here. So this is like um, the, the track, the third highest uh, D zero significance of the track inside the jet. So you can see it here. And I use the same data and recreate the same chart, but I lump the charm and the light flavor jet together as background. So these are blue that you see. And you know this chart makes sense because you know we expect a longer tail to the right for bottom quarks because again, you know, the bottom quarks have a longer lifetime. You know, the secondary, secondary vertex is further away from the primary vertex. So then when you look at D0 significance, it should be higher. So we expect a, you know, like, like a longer tail to the right for the, for the bottom jets compared to, to the um, background. And right, so I basically explained <laughs> all these words here. Uh, so we'll look at another example of the 16 variables. This is um, counts of tracks with D0 over 1.8. So it's just a threshold. Uh, Dan also created this um, variable. And so when we look at this, this is Dan's chart again. This is my chart. Um, so they basically look the same, but you know, I, I just use a smaller bin size for a histogram. That's why I like. And it's uh, discrete, right? It's a count of tracks. So, like, so I just, uh, that's why it's like, you know, a line here instead of a big horizontal lines here. But it basically is saying the same thing, you know, like um, you have more counts of tracks with higher D0 for heavier quarks, right? For bottom quarks compared to other lighter jet. Okay. So, this is all the 16 variables here. Uh, I may not have time to go into every single one here, but you know, this is 16 variables that uh, Dan published, right? And then this is uh, the recreation, like the script that I wrote to recreate this uh, histogram. 
based on the same data, same simulated data set. And again, we looked at uh, this one and this one, right? So now, um, if we were to use, you know, one of this as a discriminator to tell uh, whether where well, we can tell like from a bottom jet from from a light jet, right? So can we do that? How good can we do that? How bad is this variable? Does this variable do in telling me whether it's a bottom jet or or light jet, right? So this this question is the same as if I tell you is the color is red, how good can you tell me is the apple from just the red, right? From the attribute. So um so this is what we do. Again, we look, go back to the uh, third highest D0 significance here. This is the chart you looked at before. This is the my create recreation you looked at before. Uh, this is a new one, right? This is something called the ROC, the uh, receiver operating characteristic curve. Uh, so I'll go into what it is later on. But basically, the idea is um, if this blue line is on the red dot, then you're better off just guessing. But if this blue line is further and further away, then it's better. It's a better and better classi classifier. So this variable by itself is a pretty good classifier. And the AUC, the area under curve core, uh, score is 0.87. So if the line is on the red dot, it's 0.5. If the line is complete, it's one. And 0.5 is, you better off just guessing, one would be, um, is correct every time during the classification, right? So the score is 0.87. And what is AUC, ROC, or AUC? Uh, it goes back to this confusion matrix. This is literally called a confusion matrix. So you have a true positive rate and false positive rate, true positive rate on the y-axis in the ROC curve, FPR, false positive rate is on the x-axis, and true positive rate is uh, true positive, which is predicted positive, and is actual positive over um, actual positive, which is um, uh, will be like the true positive plus false negative, OK? So um, and then the area on the curve is just, again, the, in, you know, the uh, sum of area under the blue curve, right? OK. So this is uh, how it looks like for all the 16 variables. Like for if you were to use each one of these variables as a classifier, uh, how good they are. And you know when you look at jet ed, jet eta, and jet uh, transfer momentum, they're not really good, right? They're just 0.5. And you look at um, again, we look at this before, and it's pretty good. It's uh, number of track over 1.8. Uh, this one is pretty good. This 0.8, and the you know, the third largest uh, D0 track is uh, 0.7 here. So, so you know, so one or two that are pretty good, but all the others are, you know, mediocre, right? Not not a good classifier at all. So how about if we can combine these variables together, right? And do a multivariate model and see if that multivariate model can do uh, classification, right? So. So before we go into neural network and talk about the multivariate classification model, uh, I'd like to give some basic intuition on linear regression, just a refresher. So linear regression basically is you know y equal intercept plus ax plus bx2 plus cx3, and right. So you try to find a line to explain your data set, right? So you have all these blue dots coming in, and this will be just a, say one x1, right? This is a independent variable, the y is dependent variable. So, so you have like all these data coming in and you try to adjust your intercept and A, right? To make this red line fit most of these data. Okay, so in numerically how you do this is that you feed all these data into the equation, right? You get the y hat, which is the expected value from, from the equation and you compare the y hat to the y, right? This is the, uh, the variance, compare this Add up all the all the error together, and then you get the total error, right? And then you try to update your coefficient, you update your model 
to make to minimize this error, right? And you do it again, do it again, do it again. So there's a training process, right? So you you have all these data points, you plug in the model, get the expected value, you compare the expected value to the true value, you get the error, sum together, and then you have some optimization schemes to uh, make this model better and to try to lower the lower the error, right? Okay, so what a classical neural network look like is something similar, but it's nonlinear, right? So we are not using a linear model. Um, what it is, is that, uh, so you have the input, they call the input layer here. So there are three variables. So in my case, it'd be 16 here. And then you have a hidden layer and then an output layer. So the output layer will tell you whether it's a bottom jet or not a bottom jet, right? And then, so, so this equation here represents the green lines here, which is, uh, again, you have, a, you know, your model and then your data point, right? Your coefficient, your data point, your coefficient, data point. So you get a, so you get this z value, and then you put a z value into a nonlinear activation curve called a sigmoid curve. Uh, that's where the nonlinear come from. Okay, so then you have um, all these uh, nonlinear score, and then you get to the end. This is um, how we measure the error, right? What they call the cost function in computer science. This is like the again the y hat might, you know, the expected y compared to the y, right? So you have the cost function here, you have the cost, and then this is kind of like a scheme that you to do to minimize the cost, right, to your model. So you update the model parameters to, um, you know, to minimize this, this, uh, this, this cost here, right? So this is how classical neural network works. Um, so, so the implementation that I did uh, is on something that's called the gated recurring unit. So uh, what it is, is that uh, when you have, so this is the same diagram as the one before, but the one just like turn 90 degree counterclockwise. Again, so there's an input, there's an output, right? So there's a hidden layer. And so instead of just using one sigmoid function in a hit, hidden layer, uh, gated recurring unit will use uh, another algorithm scheme, which I'll show you later. Uh, so what it is, is so for my 16 variables, I put it here, and then you'll, um, you know, give me a projection, right? So then, so then you can train the model this way, and then uh, when you have, um, when you have enough training of the model, then you can plug in a new data set to it, the 16 variable, and it will hopefully tell you whether it's the bottom jaw or not, right? So in the future state, uh, so the GLU layer is basically um, uh, incorporate uh, the fact that you can actually use historic uh, information uh, to uh, as well. So like um, what I mean is that uh, this is usually, so think of it like, like a speech recognition, right? So when you have a sentence, you the first word, the second word, the third word, right, coming in, and you can actually Re, the model can actually remember your previous state, right? Your previous input, and use that as, also as the information for classifying, right? So this is like what a recurrent neural network tries to do. Um, so this is just showing you again. So the um, so the activation is based on a, a mix of historic uh, historic uh, projection and also the current projection, right? Okay. So this is what we get out of the uh, neural network is uh, this RLC curve per percent using all 16 variables and the AUC is 0.9 here. Uh, so it's better than any single variable that we saw before. And um, this is the result that we get. So, um, so the major accomplishment I think what I did was just that um, I wrote some starter codes uh, for you, the physics students, especially undergrad students, who, so that they can get into machine learning a lot faster. Um, so, and we also see that neural networks perform better than your very classifiers. And the next step will be, um, you know, to really use a deep neural network, uh, we need to um, yeah, get track level data set, you know, it's like a low level data set so that we can, uh, really make good use of a GRU network and also 
uh, we can perform similar analysis on another data set that we have is like uh, hex to BB bar, right? Hex to bottom, anti bottom cork data set. Um, so that's my talk for today. Any questions? Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Okay, thank you. I'm sure there are questions. I'm sure CC have questions. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, sure. <laughs> and then they'll be kicked out of the room. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, oh, that? Okay. <laughs> Television land. Yeah, I have. I actually have one, two, three, four people. Five, five people on there. Did any of you have questions? Can you actually hear me? I don't even know if they can hear me at all. Okay, no, no questions. Okay, they say no questions. They text me. Okay. Then we will, as the same goes, excuse everybody. Okay. The online people. Okay, I'll turn this off. Thanks to everybody. Yep. <laughs> thanks. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Talk to you soon.